already. All right. I only five see again. Five. Been too long, Katya. I know. I've missed this. It's been like a month. Oh, and I just got the email. <laughs> Right, everybody, uh, welcome. Feel free to start throwing in the chat. I'd love to see who's all here for our first show in almost a month. Introduce yourselves. Tell us where you're from if you want. And for those of you that are new, uh, welcome. We do have the live chat open, so if you are logged into YouTube, you can interact with us there. Uh, ask questions, make comments, etc. And we will be checking that periodically throughout the show. Hello, Kyle. Thank you for jumping on tonight. Hello. The way to compliment us about a little after eight. Jump right into talking about observing. My favorite. Wow. I definitely didn't know that live chat was a thing. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't know until we started the show, like, months before. Mm -hmm. Hey, Alex. Hey, Alex. Uh, and yes, for anybody oh. wondering, uh, Mark is also here with us at the moment. Uh, he'll be on camera soon. <laughs> so if you want us to throw your questions to Mark already, please feel free. Uh, welcome, Jeff. Good to see you again. And while we're waiting, if anybody wants to... Oh, one second.
So one of the big things we're going to be talking about today as we go through here are different observatories at different latitudes and talking about uh, all of the fun stories that even just the three of us have. So if you have some cool observing uh, stories from different observatories, please uh, send them in the chat. Uh, it's always fun to see where people have been. I, of course, want to make it to as many observatories as I can, but my list is still quite short and uh, now is not the best time to make that list any longer. So um, any recommendations we'll have, I'm uh, very excited to hear about them. I can get my uh, list growing. I'm pretty sure right now none of the observatories also actually are hosting visiting servers right now. I'd be pretty surprised. Um, from all the observatories that like my class has used, um, everything has been done either through a queue or from a professional observer who's sitting on the mountain taking images for you. Right. It's just not quite as fun. I know. All right, I think we're going to jump in in about a minute, Katya, and then uh, we'll just run through this pretty quick and get to our guest of honor for tonight. Sounds good. Yeah, I'm right there in the same boat as you, Jeff. Me too. Maybe someday just a get in the car and do a little road trip out to California, knock a couple off my list. Yeah. yeah. And New Mexico and uh, Arizona as well. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely need to get to Flagstaff. Lowell? Lowell's yeah. amazing. I was lucky to visit there. I saw a recent post of, every time I see their little uh, observing deck with the six telescopes that are on those piers, mm -hmm. oh, it just makes me so jealous. I just want to go there and observe through all six of them. Same. See, that wasn't, I don't remember that being a thing when I visited. Either it just wasn't open that day or whatnot. I remember I visited like two separate domes uh, with telescopes there. Oh, look, hit peak, Adam. <laughs> Yep, I have a special connection to Kid Peak. It's always going to have a special place in my heart. It's almost kind of sad that I grew up in Whitewater and I visited Kit Peak three times before I ever went to Yerkes. Oh. Uh, Mark, do you have the uh, volume on the live show going from YouTube? Uh, I just switched the vol that volume off, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought I heard a I thought I heard an echo. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's jump into some fun in Stellarium. So for anybody, uh, I guess I should probably uh, do a quick introduction. In case we have any new people here that have not joined an episode of the classroom in the past, welcome. My name is Adam McCulloch. I am the planetarium specialist slash outreach specialist here at Glass Education, and with me is my uh, professional astronomer co-host, recent graduate of the University of Chicago, and now a graduate student of the University of Michigan, Katya Gosman. Hello. So I'm going to be referring to Katya's expertise as we go through here, just to make sure that I am being as accurate as possible. And we are going to go through kind of a, uh, a hypothetical Observatory, observing run planning, because one of the things we're talking about is how uh, hi throughout history we have changed the way that observatories work. One of the most notable changes is when Yerkes opened in 1897. Uh, it really changed the game because before that they weren't really observatories where you went and you lived and you actually studied there. Uh, they were usually just buildings to house telescopes and you traveled out to visit them, did what you needed to do, and you left. Uh, Yerkes decided that, no, this is going to be a cathedral to science, 
and that we were going to actually be able to study here, hold classes, and actually um, do all sorts of engineering as well. So uh, that was one of the big changes in observatories in 1897. And it wasn't uh, long after uh, Yerkes became world famous and had its success that they realized that uh, being in Wisconsin with our skies is not ideal. You'd usually want to be a little bit higher up, hence why a lot of the observatories we're going to be talking about today are in the mountains and far away from uh, most people. So Yerkes was kind of the last big observatory that wasn't up in a mountain or at least somewhere very remote. And that if said, we... oh, go ahead, speaking of mountain, yeah, speaking of mountains, um, if you have a mountain that has a lot of trees, don't build a telescope there. I know California has been ravaged by forest fires right now that have been threatening some of the observatories there. Um, yeah, so but... that's why it's good to have observatories on arid mountaintops in deserts. It's also better for observing. Yes. 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 <laughs> Oh yeah, and there, yeah, there's always clouds whenever you have public nights, especially if it's if it's your keys or uh, as Kyle's mentioning here, Washburn in Madison. Uh, so one of the things we wanted to talk about are observing runs and going to observatories and what do you do before you go there. Uh, so for anybody that has never really done any kind of astrophotography or any kind of uh, study in astrophysics, uh, we're gonna do kind of just like a a faux. Uh, observing run. So we picked out an object that we thought uh, that we not only enjoy looking at but is just kind of a fun one to image. So the object we picked for today, Kati, would you like to tell us about your favorite object? Yes, so uh, if you've watched the show before you've probably heard me talk about this object a lot. Um, it is like the first deep space object that I ever saw through a telescope. Uh, and so this is the Ring Nebula. Um, it is a type of nebula called a planetary nebula. So basically, it is a star that is at the end of its lifetime. It has expelled and shed outer layers that it had when it was a red giant. Um, and those layers are now ionized. And what's left is the ionized gas around it, which forms the ring. And at the very center, you have a white dwarf star that is slowly cooling off for eternity. Yeah, and so in our uh, imaginary observing run, we are planning to study the Ring Nebula. And in order to do so, there are a couple things that we need to know. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, a lot of the issues with like observing here from Kenosha, or from uh, Lake Geneva, Williams Bay, is that there is a lot of sky, a lot of atmosphere you have to look through, hence why you typically want to now put your observatory on a mountain where there's a lot less air to look through. Well, the higher in the sky an object is, the less uh, of the atmosphere you're looking at, and the lower in the sky, because you're looking through an angle, you just cut through more and more atmosphere. Now, the ring is a great object because uh, here it, in, uh, like in Williams Bay near Yerkes, it gets very, very high in the sky. And one really cool thing about Stellarium is there are some really useful tools that you can use in order to help you plan a potential observing run. So here we can actually see how high in the sky that the ring nebula gets, which tells us a lot about uh, when is the best time to observe it. Uh, when is it at its peak? And then when would it be the, the clearest to observe? And so Katya, do you want to break down a little bit what we're seeing here with this graph? Yes. Um, so we have on the x-axis, so on the horizontal axis, we have the time at whatever location we choose in Stellarium. Uh, on the y-axis, so the vertical axis, we have the altitude of the object. So zero degrees means it's right at the horizon, and 90 degrees means it's pointed straight upwards. Uh, so this is different than the right ascension declination coordinates that we've talked about before. This is just strictly altitude from the horizon. Um, so you see there is a red line. And that shows uh, the altitude of our object during a course of time. So how high does it get in the sky? So we can see that the ring, for example, peaks about 80-ish degrees at about like a little after 20 hours. 
um, and then goes back down. And so usually when we're observing, uh, we want to plan it such that um, we observe objects as high as possible or when they are as high as possible in the sky. Um, so in this case, it would be really good to observe the ring around 20 hours or a little before and after, because that way we're looking through less atmosphere by pointing almost straight up. Um, the blue line, I believe, shows us the actual peak or that indicates the peak. Oh, the, um, the passage of the meridian. Oh, yes, the passage of the meridian. There we go. And what is the yellow line? The yellow line tells us what time it is now. So oh, if you sat here and you watched this, that out. <laughs> <laughs> so if you sat here and watched this, you would slowly see as this yellow line would creep closer yeah. and closer to when uh, the ring passes the meridian. And then after that, it begins declining lower and lower. Now, one of the reasons oh. that we picked the ring nebula, oh, Sarkat, did you have anything else that you wanted to add to that? Um, oh, I just wanted to say that um, for telescopes such as Stone Edge, for example, they have uh, certain limitations of the altitude that you can observe an object as. So not only is it important sometimes to know how high the object can get, but also how low can it go before you can't observe it at all. So for Stone Edge, for example, in California, uh, we have the limit that the telescope really shouldn't be pointed anywhere lower than 30 degrees. So we cannot observe any objects that don't rise above that. Just another thing to keep in mind when you're planning observation sessions. Yeah, and that's actually a really good thing to add. And Stellarium also has this built in where you have this tool where you can increase the altitude limit so that you only see when your object becomes visible. And whenever it crosses this axis, you then do know, uh, okay, I can no longer view that object after that. Uh, another helpful tip, figuring out when the sun is up is also quite useful. And Stellarium also puts the lines of astronomical twilight. And so you can find right at this intersection what time, where, uh, where the ring nebula, how high the ring nebula will be at astronomical twilight and what time that is. So this is a really, really good tool whenever you're trying to plan uh, an observing session looking at any specific object. Now this, of course, is only for us here in Williams Bay. It's not going to be the same for everybody at uh, a bunch of different observatories. So one of the things that we wanted to do is show you that if you go to other observatories around the world, uh, your graph can change quite a bit. So instead of being here in Williams Bay, we are going to head a little bit north, and we're actually going to go up to Greenland, where there's the Greenland Radio Telescope. Now, obviously, this telescope is using a different uh, wavelength of light to study objects, but still have to plan observing sessions uh, for those objects when they're actually up in the sky. And so now you can see that the ring, instead of being quite high in the sky is a bit lower because we went much farther north on Earth. And if we go and use our handy dandy tool over here, you can see that the ring now peaks at about 59 degrees. So it doesn't get quite as high in the sky and intersects 30 degrees at slightly different times. Now, unfortunately, the, this one is not too much of a difference because we didn't really change uh, where we are that much. We did go significantly farther north, uh, but there, uh, the changes in the sky will be much more drastic if we actually end up going uh, much more south. So one of the observatories we're going to be talking about in a little bit is the Magellan, it, and uh, Katya will be telling us all about that and sharing some really cool pictures. So we're going to actually go travel down there, and the observatory that Magellan is located at, Ooh, wrong window, is Las Campanas Observatory. Is it Atacama? In the Atacama Desert, yeah. Okay. Um, also, speaking of wavelengths of light, as you were saying, there are some telescopes where things like clouds um, and all that 
don't really matter because there are some wavelengths of light that are basically they they can pass through the Earth's atmosphere just fine. Um, and so depending on what you want to observe, sometimes it's okay if you have clouds. Or sometimes it's okay if you observe during the day. Right. And sometimes it's okay if you have a full moon up. So basically there's um, different different proposals for time. They can get place they get placed based on what kind of weather you need. Some proposals you can do with very poor weather, others you need very, very good weather and seeing. And so uh, now we are significantly farther south in the world, all the way down into Chile. And you can see that the Ring Nebula is now no longer in the south, but all the way to the north. And it does not look very high in the sky, and that's in part because it is not. And if we go and use our tool once more, if you notice, there is no longer a red line. Because in Las Campanas, uh, for the Magellan Telescope, M57 does not cross 30 degrees today. So you would not have the opportunity to image it even if you wanted to. So using tools like this and being aware of what objects are up and when is kind of a key part of knowing what observatory you need to go to in order to actually study that object. Now, uh, there's also another extreme because if you travel even further south, there actually is an observatory in the South Pole. And uh, I know, I believe Kyle Cudworth might be able to uh, add a little bit about that into the chat. But if we just head on down to the South Pole, I believe it is right around down here. And we look around for the Ring Nebula. It is no longer anywhere in our night sky. And what we'd have to do is actually take uh, the ground away, look down below the north, and have to peer through the Earth in order to actually see the Ring Nebula. Sometimes I wish we could just take the ground away in real life so I could see all the southern hemisphere constellations. Wouldn't it not be nice? And objects. <laughs> just to go look at the um, large and small Magellanic clouds yep. every now and then. Yep. <laughs> Uh, be quite convenient. But, no less. but yeah, so this Stellarium, as uh, we've mentioned in the past, is a free tool that you can download and use yourself to plan your own observing sessions if you want to go outside and take advantage of the night sky. Uh, but with that, we are going to now shift gears and talk to our guest tonight. Uh, welcome to the show, Mark. Let me... Hey guys, okay. how, are you, how are you guys doing? <laughs> we are doing fantastic, and we're really excited to hear about uh, your trip out to uh, uh, Palomar. And uh, one thing that I noted when we were sending out the information about this live stream is that you not only have uh, a significant amount of experience with uh, Palomar, you also have experience with another one of George Hale's biggest accomplishments in uh, your keys. Yeah, a little bit, yes. <laughs> I think you're being a little modest there. Well, you know, it's a, uh, it, it, it all blends together after a while. Yeah. Oh, and I'm messing up the screen right now. Adam, your OBS is like an infinite mirror kind of deal. <laughs> yeah, I did the wrong thing. Now, uh, do people see the uh, the slides? They do, yes. And I'm just adding our faces in yes. a second. Okay. Uh, no. I think, nope, that's not it. One second, Mark. Sorry about this. Uh, no problem. There we go. Now yeah. we should be good to go. All right. Tell us a little bit about Palomar. Okay, sure. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about before about how do you plan an observing run. Uh, it's for astronomers, it's not just knowing where things are in the sky. There's a little bit more work involved because 
these most of these telescopes are now cheap to operate, and there's a lot of demand to use these telescopes. So today I'm going to tell you a bit more about, from the point of view of the astronomer, what is it like to observe at the telescope and you know to to get observation time at the telescope and why does it make sense for people to support astronomers using telescopes uh, so what you see here is actually uh can you guys see my mouse yes excellent so this is uh, a picture uh taken on palomar mountain uh this mountain looks green, but it's actually quite dry. Yes, they often have forest fires there too. That's why there's a, you see there's a lot of cut grass all over the mountain uh, in order to make sure the flames don't go too close to the telescope or to the other, the, to the other um, uh, equipment they have up there. Uh, the main, oops, wrong button. How about this one? No, how about this one? Ah, okay, here we go. Uh, the main telescope at Palomar is the, uh, the five meter or more known as the 200 inch telescope, which uh, this is a picture of it. Now, this telescope is really gigantic. So basically, if you see here, these little cars that you see down here on the bottom right side, these are actually big pickup trucks. And those little dots up here, those are actually people. So this is the dome of the telescope in here you see the telescope uh this is the 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 main part of the telescope and i this is part of a horseshoe shaped part of the suspension which i'll i'll talk about in a bit uh so this is the largest telescope that was designed by hale and even though they started to build it uh while hey hale was still alive the telescope only finished many years after Hale died. One of the main reasons why it took so long is that in between there was World War II and everybody was busy doing something else and building telescopes. The, uh, so the, the telescope was started to build in 1936. And one of the main things they needed for the telescope is the mirror. And the mirror was uh, created by Corning Glass in New York. And so there was actually kind of a science roadshow when that mirror was put on a train and then carted throughout the entire United States. And every t the, the, the newspaper and every, everybody knew exactly where that mirror was. And so people in towns and villages all along the way knew exactly when was that giant mirror the world's biggest mirror for the world's newest telescope going to come through their town. And there were thousands and thousands of people that went to witness as that train wagon with the giant mirror on it went through their town. This dome is very tall. It's about 41 meters or about 120 feet tall. And it's about the same uh, as wide as it, it is tall. This entire dome rotates, including this catwalk here. So this, uh, this uh, we call this a catwalk, where you see these people up here. And that also, that also rotates. And so that whole part, part that rotates is about 1,000 tons in weight. So if you're on there while it rotates, this is roughly what it looks like. So what you see here, this was a picture taken while on the catwalk, while the telescope dome rotates. And you see, it's a really, really weird feeling. It's a bit of feeling like if any of you have ever been in a boat, you know, a big ship like a ferry or a cruise ship, and then you get out of harbor, you see you're on something really big and stable, but everything around it still moves. Okay, this is a picture um, from inside the dome, what the telescope looks like. It's a fisheye uh, lens image. And what you see here, basically, this here is a slit of the telescope. So these are the two doors that kind of open sideways like that to reveal the sky to the telescope. Light then comes in here. This is 
kind of the tube of the telescope. It's not really a tube, but more of a uh, of a, uh, of of of, a, of of a solid piece to attach the mirror. Um, well, with many bars and other things, engineers are very good at making sure these things are light but still don't fall apart. And so the light travels down here, hits the primary mirror, which is down here, and then gets reflected up here. And up here is the focus. And the first time they built this telescope here, this was called the primary focus. And some of you may have seen in the chat, somebody was talking about the primary focus. This is it. So as an astronomer in evening, you went up here, up here, and then you went up this ladder all the way. You climbed all the way up until you sat in this cylindrical box. And that's where you would take your images. So that's where the astronomers spent the night, up here, suspended um, almost 100 feet over the floor of the telescope building. Now, what they've done more recently in order to be able to change instrument and to use larger instrument, here they put a secondary mirror. And so now the prime focus is down here. And this is, this is called the cage. And so in the main mirror, there's a hole where the light goes through to whatever the instrument is in the cage. Now, I guess some of you are probably familiar with telescopes and with cameras. And there's one big difference between telescope and cameras, which is that if you have a camera, you know, an expensive camera, you may change the lens in front of your camera. So basically, you, you take off the lens, you put it away, and you put another lens in front of your camera. Well, for astronomers, the lens is actually a building that can be over 100 feet tall, and it's definitely not going anywhere. Hmm. So in change of changing the lens in front of your camera, you change the camera behind your lens. Or for astronomers speak, you basically switch a different instrument down here in the cage when astronomers want to do different kinds of observations. And for Palomar, they have like half a dozen instruments that they can use in there in the cage to observe. So, now, Mark, go ahead. I have a quick question for you. So somebody yeah. actually brought up earlier before we even got to this, so I was waiting. Did you actually yeah. get a chance to go up into the old cage and sit up there? No. Oh. They uh, officially they don't let you walk up this uh, this ladder anymore. Officially. <laughs> well, I I I somehow remember in my album somewhere there's a picture of me up here, but I really don't. I it's probably photoshopped. <laughs> of course, yeah. yes, no, definitely not mm -hmm. genuine. But one place they do let you go is down here in the cage where the instrument is, and at one point I was at Palomar observing we were building a new instrument and we tested that instrument at Palomar. And at one point, well, they were having problems like with the electronics or with the software. And I was in the cage. And so where they were looking at a very bright star, I think it was Vega or Altair. I don't remember, but it was a really bright star. And so I put my hand in the path of the light. And on my hand, you know, when you take a laser pointer, not the red one, but one of the bright one, green ones, and you shine it into your hand. Mm -hmm. I had no, a white. Mark, why would we know that? Totally. That's dangerous. <laughs> so I had a white point of light in my hand, the image of the star. And it was really impressive for me because I was thinking that I was sitting down there in that cage. This whole room was dark, by the way, really, you know. Lights off, right? We're observing. And as I was sitting down there under this 200 inch mirror, I was collecting light from that star, and all the light that was in my hand had been traveling longer than I was alive. So it's, it, it, there's, there's not a lot of moments as astronomers when you kind of feel connected to what's out there in the universe, but this was definitely one of these moments. Yeah. That's really cool. So the other thing here, this telescope 
you see how it's suspended. So it's basically the suspension is here. There's an axis. Then there's these two big cylinders. There's one here and one on the other side. And then here, there's this big thing that looks like a horseshoe. And this thing looks like a horseshoe such that the, the telescope can point all the way to the north. So this axis here is pointing straight to the north. And the shape of this horseshoe, this, uh, of the suspension of the telescope allows us to point this telescope all the way to the north. Uh, I have also have an image here, if it works. Oh, yeah, here it does. This is a telescope moving. So this is a really big telescope. So it's not like the uh, uh, the Yerkes telescope where you know somebody who has experience with it, like Kyle or someone else, can just grab it and move it around. Uh, no, this. Uh, so this is how fast it moves. Now, considering that the sky usually moves really slow, uh, this is plenty fast for movement for one of these telescopes. Actually, I'm going short. Otherwise. Uh, except, are there any other questions at this point? I think you're good so far. Right. Oh, Kyle is bragging in the chat how he got to go and sit in the cage when he was there. Uh, at the bottom or at the top? Uh, let's see. He We actually got to the prime cage using an elevator that would get a foot or so above the cage, and then we climbed down into it. So. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I've... I think I saw that elevator, but no, they never let me use that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jeff yeah, brings was, up a good point. Oh, go ahead, Katya. I was recently reading a, a book uh, that someone was writing about observational astronomy, and they said that the author, the author themselves even, they were trying to go to different observatories to see if they could sit in a prime focus cage, but did not get permission, even as someone writing a book about this. Yeah, it's... It's hard. <laughs> Well, all these places can be dangerous. I mean, there's the obvious danger of falling whenever you're on a big structure like that. And, you know, that's always bad publicity and the falling usually hurts. Mm -hmm. But there's also other places, for instance, there, there's a telescope uh, the, the, uh, where, you know, when things turn or things move, it can hurt you and it can squish you. So if I can find the right button to go one, one image back, so here, you guys see how these big cylinders here are kind of flat here. Well, that's because if the telescope leans over all the way to the left or to the right, then this part of the cylinder basically almost touches the floor here. Hmm. And when that comes close to the floor, you better don't be in between. <laughs> between because the force of this motor that rotates this telescope can, uh, can, be, cannot be, can be very unnice with you, yes. Yeah, so there is a, you know, I mean, these are these are places where, where you know, it's uh, where bad things can happen, and we want everybody to be safe. Right. Plus, you know, not talk about the electrical problems and other th uh, challenges and things like that. Actually, I just spent the day today building a part of an instrument, and we built the 110 AC. Uh, AC part of that instrument and yeah making sure we tested it and made sure every nobody was touching it while we we're powering it up for the first time it, um, so yeah you know it's just something to watch out for you know the dangers you be careful yes uh, so going further now let's talk a bit more about the experience as an astronomer so as an astronomer, if you want to go to a telescope, the first thing you do is you write a proposal, which is basically, why do I want to use this telescope? Why should you, who own the telescope, or the committee who is responsible for uh, checking which astronomers are allowed to use the telescope, why should you let me use this telescope? So basically, this is an example of a proposal that I wrote for Palomar. So basically, you say, the main thing you have to say is, what is the science you want to do? So what stars do you want to observe? Why is it important for science to observe these stars? Why is it important to use this particular telescope for the particular observations you want to do? And also, what can you figure out or what do you expect to figure out from your observations? 
What do you think they will teach you and, and other astronomers? The, another thing you also need to do while you write a proposal similar to what Katya and Adam told you guys, be, showed you before, is to figure out where things are going to be in the sky. And you also have to do some calculations to figure out how long you want to observe which object mm -hmm. to figure out, to, to make sure you get a good enough image of the things you want to observe. So all the astronomers uh, write proposals like that, and then they send them all in these days electronically to a committee. And then everybody on that committee reads through the proposals and figures out which ones are the best ones to observe, uh, to use, and who gets to use the telescope. And this is a really important process because it helps make sure that all these wonderful facilities, all these telescopes that are ultimately paid for mostly by the taxpayer get used really well. And that all these telescopes get used by astronomers that are really going to do interesting, interesting science and not just, hey, I would really like to have a cool picture of the moon. <laughs> yeah. So this is, and with this, um, so here I say large priority. Oh yes, another thing, uh, support TOO interrupts. That means target of opportunity. That means if you say yes here, that means that if there's like a supernova going off or a gamma ray and some scientists that are observing these things say, we need observe right now. Can you please use the telescope instead? You say, yes, we let you use the telescope. And I mean, this is something uh, all astronomers are quite, um, uh, usually quite nice to each other. And you know, it's, it's all a community and uh, everybody uses these, uh, these facilities and you know, make sure everybody wants to make sure they're used well. Of course, I want to do my observations too. And so does anybody else. Uh, so, so I have a question for you, Mark. Um, when you wrote this proposal, uh, one, how long does a proposal like this take to put together? And two, what made you choose the 200 inch Hale telescope? Uh, so the, the time it takes, the first time you write a proposal, uh, think about, yeah, it takes a while. <laughs> uh, if most more and more and more as you get into it, you can kind of recycle most of the proposal. You know, if say last year we only did some observations, but we couldn't finish them, then I'm just going to copy and paste and say, we didn't finish it last year. We, we made these amazing discoveries with the data we got last year. Imagine what awesome things we could observe and find if we get observe all the other objects as well. Please let us observe. So that gets uh, easier and easier, but you know it's yeah, it's a few days of work, yes, and maybe even weeks if you're doing that for the first time. <laughs> but I mean, I wrote here. You see, for instance, Terry Herter. He was my advisor. Uh, he so he helped me a lot. Luke Keller, who was a postdoc. This is when I was a grad student. He. Uh, he helped me a lot for this proposal. Actually, I took, I intensively studied one of his proposals that he had written for a similar observation. And the third person here, David Whelan, at this point he was, David was an undergraduate and he's now professor, I think somewhere in Maryland, yes. Hmm. So, you know, you have different people and uh, yeah, uh, my advisor was too busy to come, but both Luke and David. Actually, you guys will see a picture of them soon. Yes. Any other questions about the proposal process? Right. So next, when you go travel to Palomar uh, and you know you're going to observe, it's kind of important that you make sure that you can stay up all night. So what you usually do is you travel there one day early and you join whichever group is observing that night in the telescope and you try to stay up as long as you possibly can. And then you go here, it's kind of a hostel for astronomers. Uh, it's, uh, there's bedrooms and you see all the bed, bedroom windows are very black 
And this is because all these bedrooms have like shades that make it totally dark. And this is very important because you want to sleep as long as you can through the afternoon, if possible. And then you get up in the afternoon, maybe you have a, a short meal and then there's a big meal uh, that everybody that's going to observe that night is having together uh, about one hour before sunset. And then you grab a snack for on the way and you leave to go towards the, uh, the telescope. And then you observe all night. You may have a lunch at two in the morning. And, you know, usually uh, depending on how good the observations go or how, you know, you stay up until sunrise and that's when you go to bed. So this is a typical day of an astronomer while she or he is observing. So most of the work happens here in the, uh, in, in the control room. So you see, this is a control room for one of the telescopes. It's actually not Palomar. This is uh, one of the uh, control room for one of the telescopes in Hawaii. Well, that I've also used. Oops, wrong button, sorry. And you see here, there's a lot of different technologies. You have LCD. LCD screens, you have CRT screens, all the CRT screens, and then lots of buttons and other things. So we have here all the technologies from like the 50s to today. <laughs> and the reason why you see that is because those telescopes are unique. It would cost a lot of money to rebuild them. But you can basically put new life into a telescope by modernizing it, adding more better electronics, better control electronics, adding adaptive optics, adding new instruments. And basically, so what you see here in this control, uh, control room is that the old technology that is still being used, probably this is how to move the telescope. Then a, more, a somewhat newer technology, this seems to be coordinates for where the telescope is pointing, a more accurate system that they had when they originally built it. And then here you see an even more modern system, which is the system to control the camera, which is the newest part of the telescope, because you know cameras are, are easy to replace for astronomers because they cost less than building a whole new telescope. And so usually in most telescope, there's a telescope operator, somebody who really knows the telescope, who helps you do the observations, or you go with an astronomer who's used the telescope before and you know can teach you how to how to observe uh, most of the time when you're oops wrong button again sorry when you're in the telescope you're hanging out if everything goes right and you did all your planning right then all you need to do is point the telescope press a button and there's just not much to do while the uh, camera is taking images. So here you see that's me and that's the, the postdoc who was with me and the undergraduate student, Dave, Luke and David, who were with me on that observation. As I said, telescopes are a dangerous uh, environment. And so whenever there's building going on, or even if you just go out there at night, because there may be telescopes swooping by and trying to hit you in the head, uh, they have helmets that are ready to use for anybody who wants to go out in the middle of the night. Another thing you do is you also, if you have all your observations planned, you're good. But as soon as you get data from the telescope, you would want to reduce the data to look at the quality of the images to make sure the images are what you expect and what you want. And so, for instance, if you figure out, oh, we're already done with this object, the, date, the image that we have is good enough. Let's go to the next star. Or if you realize that, oops, this image didn't work out well, we should observe that star again, then you can do it on the fly. So that's why it's important to do that. There are also sometimes very frustrating nights when you're just waiting for the clouds to go away. And I've more than once had a night about the telescope Everybody with you was there, ready to go. And all we're doing is waiting for the clouds to go away. Yeah. 
that's a time when you actually have time to write your next proposal. <laughs> yeah. Never lose a minute. Yeah. Um, any questions at this point? I don't think so. Okay. So once you have the data, you need to reduce it. Now, this is an example of a little more interesting data. It's not just images. So this is an example of some spectra that we took of a star where we were studying the disk around that star. So this here is the image. What you see here is basically that image was made by having a slit in the camera and the image of the star went into that, uh, onto that slit. And then the light from the slit was led through a, uh, a grism or a prism uh, that spreads the light out as a spectrum. And so here you see the light of the star spread out as a spectrum, okay? And this gives us a spectroscopic image of the star. And then what we do, we slightly move the star to a different part of the slit, and then we take another image. So these are the two images. Now these two images, although they're exactly the same, they're scaled differently. This is log scaled and this is linear scaled. And for instance, what you see here is, you see here a line of bad pixels. So here the camera has some bad pixels and this shows up as dark line. There's another thing you see here, which is you see it here and you see the, see the corresponding feature here. So this is a, a place uh, in the spectrum where that star is emitting less light. What you also see here, you see these vertical lines here. You don't see them here because of the scaling, but they're here as well. And these are actually emission lines from the atmosphere. So you have some gases up in the atmosphere that emit light in at these wavelengths, and those also show up in your image. So there's a lot of things to get dirty things to get rid of to get a nice picture of the spectrum. The first thing you clean both images using a bad pixel map. Remember those line of bad pixels that we have on detector? You get rid of it. Then you use a flat field, which helps you correct for how different pixels react to the light. Some pixels in, the, in this instrument will react more to light and some less. So you correct that. And once you have done that, you subtract this image from that image and you get a subtracted chop, which is shown down here. So basically here we have the, the positive image that was taken in one chop location here, and then the negative image here that was taken in the other chop location. And if you look at this kind of from the side, so look at this image, but from the side, this is what it looks like, the positive chop and the negative chop. And then you do a mathematical shifting and moving over, subtracting again and co-adding, and then for each line here, so for each wavelength, you get the spectra of the star. So here, this down here is a spectra of the star. And the nice thing is because we subtract the two image from each other, we know that we don't have atmospheric emission lines here anymore. So this is kind of your raw spectral data. So you will have to calibrate that in frequency and then also use data from a calibrator star to subtract because some of these lines here are not from the star we're looking at. Some of these lines here are actually from atmospheric absorption and you need to get rid of that. And then you are left over with the spectrum of your star. And then your work is actually only starting because then you have to figure out, so what does this mean? That the spectrum of this star is that way. And after comparing it to other stars and work that other people have done, and maybe more of your data, if you're lucky, you, get, you finally get to write a paper about it. And this is a paper that we wrote about the, um, about some of the data that we got there or a similar data. And there basically you say, hey, look, other astronomers, I observed these stars. This is what I figured out about them. And uh, this, uh, this is the data. It's always very important to show the data that you observe so other people can, uh, independent of what your opinion is of that data, other people can get their own opinion of what the data means. 
and then figure out what it means. And you, then you, you do your analysis and you say, well, this is what I think it probably means. Yes. And so this is the whole process. And in reality, for most astronomers, you're writing a couple of proposals and going observing and writing papers kind of all at the same time. Because you always have ideas what you want to see. You always have some data that's sitting on your computer and waiting for you to an analyze it. But you also have data always, usually have data that you already analyzed and want to get the paper out. So yeah, as an astronomer, multitasking is kind of important, but that's, that's part of the fun, yeah. So oh, Mark, but, oh. <laughs> I have a very random question, but why oh. are your spectra called chop A and chop B? Do you know? I've never heard that term before. Uh, chop A and chop B? That's- Yeah, like what, well, what is a chop? The chop is basically <laughs> we move the telescope back and forth between having the star here and having the star down here. And that's called chopping. So it's just a particular movement of a part of the telescope that allows you to quickly move the star between two locations in the uh, on on the on in the camera. I and see. we call them A A and B because astronomers do not have a lot of imagination. Otherwise, we would call them uh, I don't know uh, Fred and James. Or some other name, yeah. <laughs> so is this the, so you would probably go through this whole process right away once you got your first spectra back while you were mm -hmm. at, in the observatory or was this normally uh, later? This process, yes. Yeah, this particular process, we could do it at the observatory. Afterwards, we would also need guide stars and take images of guide stars. And this usually wouldn't have time to do that at the observatory, yeah. Yeah. Right. The thing is, you know, when, especially if you, it's your first time observing this, a lot of things that can go in funny ways. So, in theory, if you if you've done such observations before, you just press a button on your computer and everything gets reduced instantly. In reality, there's always things that you didn't think of, things you didn't set up correctly, and then there's you know sometimes there's bad images that at, at when you took an image, there was some technical challenge with the, uh, with the camera and it just didn't work. And then you need to get that image out and make sure you reduce the rest of the data. I gotta say, I've done spectral reduction before, mm -hmm. uh, not from Palomar, but with uh, data taken at Gemini. And Figuring out how to reduce that was quite the struggle, at least for me, who had never done it before. I was working with someone else, um, mm -hmm. and we had to read like a slew of documentation on all the different steps that you need to take to do the reduction. It's not trivial. Um, it's not just like, oh, take two images, like subtract this, whatever, get something out of it. There's like a whole bunch of things underneath um, that you have to do yeah. in order to just get like a, ca a nice calibrated spectrum. Um, and then of course, analyzing the spectrum, as Mark said, like if you wanna look at emission lines, for example, you sometimes, you wanna measure the emission lines, you know, you wanna like fit curves to them, figure out their widths, et cetera. Um, and so there's a lot of work that you can do just from like a couple of images. There's a whole lot of analysis that follows afterward. Um, and all that entire, like the very deep analysis process is probably usually done after the observing, but during observing, it is from what I've learned uh, from other observers and other professors, very important to be able to get data and do a very rough analysis right away to make sure that one, your data looks well logical that you're doing the right thing, you know, you don't see any weird anomalies or things you wouldn't expect. And also just analyze it for some quick, you know, results like, oh, let's like measure this line, this emission line really quick. Like, oh, what are our results? Like, what does this tell us? Like, what does this raw analysis tell us? Is there anything interesting? 
Yeah, if you have time, because that can also, you know, if you if you see a feature, for example, if you're like, oh, there's an emission line here, that could be a sign that, oh, maybe I want to take some more observations of this object. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you're, you're, you're absolutely right that the uh, spectra is very different to analyze, but it also can tell you much more. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a saying among astronomers that I heard you, I'm sure you all heard the saying that an image says more than a thousand words. Yeah. Well, astronomers say a spectra says more than a thousand images. Uh, because usually with spectra, you can do so much deeper analysis of various mm -hmm. features of the spectra of, as you say, line width, different lines, the intensity of the different lines relative to each other. So there's so much more you can study just in a wiggly line, something that looks like a wiggly line, but yeah. is really uh, the the essence of uh, a stellar object. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, spectra is really important for measuring redshift. Um, so like measuring how far away it is from us, an object is from us. Yeah, magnetic yeah. fields and kinematics. Yeah. Yeah. And um, especially, you know, combining when you decide to combine spectra with imaging and pho photometric observations, so measuring flux and how much light you're getting, that is like the ultimate combination that gets you a whole slew of data. Yeah, that's really where the, the all the analysis comes in. And this is why, as an astronomer in an analysis like this paper, we didn't only use our data, we also looked at images and other data that other astronomers took of these objects, or uh, even spectra at different wavelengths, to cross-analyze it and to figure out what is the whole picture about these stars and what can, how can our data with the other knowledge give us a more full picture of these, this, for these particular stars and then also extrapolate of what does that mean for that kind of stars. What we're studying here were Herbie Gay B stars, which are young, very bright, and massive stars. And basically, we're uh, trying to figure out what is it, uh, what can we figure out about the disk, uh, the gas swirling around these stars, and what can that tell us about the star formations and how these stars form. So that's what we were, uh, we're working on. Yeah. Uh, I have a few more images, if, if people still have energy, uh, but talking about uh, building uh, instruments and telescopes more in general. Should, I, should we move on? Let's do it. Oops. Yeah, I, I think I've lost some people. Uh, I think you're frozen, Mark. Can you still hear us? Yeah, now I hear you guys again. OK, good. Uh, yeah, I think if you want to do a quick overview of that. Okay. And then Kati and I have some pictures that we'd like to share as well. OK, good. So let me just, since you guys already know Palomar, uh, show you our experience in, we had an instrument uh, called Forecast that was actually for the SOFIA telescope. But we brought it to Palomar to, um, to test it. And so this is an image of us building Palomar. Uh, sorry. Building you built for Palomar, Mark. Wow. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, building forecast at at your at um, Cornell. Uh, yeah, the instrument came in nice Cornell red, and this in the lab we're uh, taking the instrument apart. So basically, uh, what you see here mostly is the mechanical part, but I was mostly working on the optical design of this uh, and uh, optical testing and then various parts of the software. So, and then eventually you put everything in boxes. Uh, you take the instrument apart, you know, to make sure nothing gets hurt on the way. And you bring everything to Palomar and there you put your instrument back together. And then you put it in the cage and you see this is the forecast instrument that's being attached under inside the cage atta uh, attached to the bottom of the Palomar 200 inch mirror. And you see, it's something you want to do very slowly because this is a really heavy instrument. And again, it, not only can you fall here, but something can fall on you. So people want to be really, care really careful. Uh, then a bit later, you also have, whenever you have a new instrument, 
there's a huge amount of testing to be done. Does everything work? Does the electronics work? And here you have some people that are right now testing the uh, testing the instrument and making sure that that it works. And they're they're working on on diagnostics. One thing we can do. So this was an infrared camera. So instead of putting a light there to see, can you see the light? What you do is you put in a soldering iron. And this is a picture of a soldering iron with an astronomical camera. And so it's a very nice hot source. You wave the soldering iron back and forth and you see, can we see something in the image? And that tells us if our camera is working or not. The other thing, and this is something where the chopping that we talked about before is more important. This is an infrared camera, so we can test it with hot soldering irons, but also the sky is very bright in the infrared. So instead of only doing chopping, like I told you before, with the other observation, you also do something called nodding. And then basically that means what you do, you take four images of the star. It, you take, basically you go put the star in one place in your, uh, on your camera and then you chop back and forth. So basically you slightly move the telescope very quickly. And that gives you two images, one in this location, one in that location. And then you do the same thing, but moving the telescope slightly in different direction, which is called a nod. And again, you move the telescope relatively quickly between the two chop locations. And then you combine all these images together. And this is really something you see a lot of background effects. So here, this image that you see here on the bottom left is only you subtract two chops from each other and you don't really see a star. And then the second image here is you subtract the nodes. So this image minus that image or this image minus that image. And you also don't really see a star because there's background effects that you see just from the varying like temperature of the mirror of the telescope. But if you subtract both chops from each other and then both uh, subtract the chops from one to the other, you combine this, then you get an image where you can actually see the image of the star that you're looking at. And so this is a trick that astronomers use many, for many telescopes when they do infrared observations in order to get rid of any, any effects that they have. And this is something we developed when we uh, developed the uh, forecast instrument, these, these techniques. Another thing you need to do when you, have, uh, uh, when you have telescopes is there's a lot of maintenance going on. And this is the image what Palomar looked like when we arrived once when we wanted to test one of our instruments. And you see there's a big thing missing here, which is the main mirror. Well. What happened is the mirror was in a mirror coating facility here. And this is actually the whole mirror gets taken off and moved into this big vacuum chamber. And then they first they scrape off all the surface of the mirror. And then inside this vacuum chamber, they evaporate, I think it was aluminum. Somebody in the audience may actually know better than me what it was. I think it was, uh, you evaporate some metal, and then that evaporated metal deposits itself onto the mirror. And then when this process is finished and the mirror is cooled down, you take, it, you take the mirror out. And this is the freshly coated mirror. This, uh, that is ready to be moved again under the telescope. So this is the actual mirror of the Palomar 200 inch, uh, inch telescope. Now, this guy was there because the only way to make sure when they drive the mirror back under the telescope, the only way to make sure everything is aligned is to have somebody in there. So this, this gentleman would go in there and then this whole assembly is on basically like a train wagon. It moves over under the telescope and gets lifted under the telescope. And he has to be there to make sure everything's aligned. And only once the mirror is attached, and they take the, the, the train wagon off, then he can come out through this hole and get back out. So uh, this is another example of just, it's not just all, only astronomers observing, all these facilities also need 
a lot of lot of maintenance and there's a lot of very talented people that look after these facilities and make sure that they they always run so this is all I, uh, all I have uh, yeah thanks a lot to everybody for listening if you have any more questions uh, yeah feel free to ask yeah and I think the next uh, probably five to ten minutes before we call it a night here is just Kati and I we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the observatories we're familiar with um, well, we didn't get to uh, go and do anything quite as cool as this. Uh, and once Kati shares her screen, then the screen will look a little less odd. Is that good? Oh, it's it's trying. Uh, is it going? It's trying. Oh, I think uh, we got it. Okay, there we go. Awesome. All right, yeah, and if anyone has questions about any of the stuff we're talking about, ask in the chat. Uh, so yeah, Adam, do you want to start us off? Sure. So with, uh, I have- American Observatory. Yes. So this was an observatory that is in- Go. All right, I think we got- Looking, looking, oh yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay. So uh, this is an observatory that we actually talked about in the, I saw people mention in the comments, Jeff has been here before. It's a very common uh, observatory to visit. This is the Kitt Peak National Observatory, uh, just outside of Tucson, about two hours outside. And I was very lucky my freshman year of college to uh, get to actually travel out here. So uh, when I went to Carthage, I uh, had no idea what I wanted to do. I was an undecided major and completely directionless, and I took an astronomy lab class in order to get my lab science requirement out of the way. And about halfway through the semester, uh, my professor asked if anybody was interested in filling one of the vacant slots on a, an observing run to the Kitt Peak National Observatory. And uh, my hand shot up so quick, I, I was almost surprised that I was raising my hand. And I just had to pay the, pain, the, the, uh, the flight of a plane ticket, and I got to go out here. Um, now, as something that has been mentioned before, and as Kyle has mentioned in uh, some of the comments, uh, bad weather does strike, and I was pegged as the bad luck person after my first run, because our first two nights of the three nights that we had for observing on the wind 0.9 meter, so Pat, if you want to bring up the picture of that telescope specifically, we'll get to that one. Is that's, that is the wind 0.9 meter, and it's one of the oldest uh, telescopes on the mountain. And uh, our first two nights, it was entirely cloudy. Uh, couldn't break through anything, but it looked promising for the third night. And as soon as the third night came, the humidity sat at about 95%, which is about 5% higher than the threshold where Kitt Peak allows domes to open. So my first three observing nights were spent playing with Maxim DL and playing with data from previous observing runs with other students. So my professor made a promise that I would make it on at least one more trip. Uh, and he said, if I, of course, if the next one went as poorly, I wouldn't be allowed on the third. Uh, luckily, my next trip, we had three very clear nights, no issues whatsoever. And this was actually, these were actually pictures uh, from that uh, second trip out. So Kat, if you go back, um, one of my favorite things about using the wind 0.9 meter was the camera that happened to be on that telescope. Um, I want to say it's like the SK2BM or something like that. Uh, those, it's something with those letters all jumbled around. And every eight hours, we had to refill the liquid nitrogen in the tank in order to keep the camera cool. So one of us would always have to draw the short straw and see who had to get up early after the observing run and go out and put... Uh, more coolant in the camera and uh, I thought it was one of the coolest things you wear the gloves you got to wear your headlamp and changing the uh, the line there so that was uh, one of my first two my first trip we were going to study planetary nebula my second trip we studied we did asteroid photometry and then my third trip I finally actually got to take images of that planetary nebula and uh, so uh, Kit Peak actually inspired me to switch my major to physics and start, kicked off my love of astronomy. So for me, that's, that's where it started, all right there.
do not eat. Was there a sign? <laughs> Uh, oh, you mean, what planet you mean, uh, nebulas? The nitrogen? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah, I definitely did not want to eat that. <laughs> uh, there are some uh there are some physics people who do stupid thing who do dares with that, yes. I'm surprised we didn't do anything stupid with it, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I think I we were just too nervous on that trip. We weren't yeah. quite comfortable enough yet. <laughs> Um, and as far as book planetary nebulas, they were um, NGCs that uh, most people would not recognize. And remembering four numbers in a row is not my specialty. Uh, but I can I can dig back and see if I can actually find those images. I know where they're kept. Um, they're in a Dropbox, so I can actually still access those. So I might uh, I might send those to you, Jeff, if you're if you're curious. I do remember we were trying to get it nicknamed. And it, we wanted to call it the Screaming Football Nebula uh, because it kind of looks like a football and has like flames coming off. So we were trying to get it named the Screaming Football. So Katya, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, your almost observing run? And so now you have, oh, you're muted, Katya. So now, Katya, we are giving you a uh, public forum to Air your grievances about COVID-19. Just as everybody has a reason to complain about COVID-19, you have a especially uh, heartbreaking reason to complain about COVID-19. Uh-huh. Um, if you could call it heartbreaking, I guess. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was supposed to go observe at the Magellan Telescope uh, located in, Las in the Las Campanas Observatory in Chile. Um, so... Magellan, it's actually a set of two twin telescopes. They're both six and a half meters or 21 foot tall mirrors twin, and they had a bunch of different instruments on them. Um, there were three main instruments that we were going to use. Um, they were called FIRE, Four Star, and IMAX. I don't remember what all those acronyms actually stand for, so I'm not even going to try. Um, but they were, uh, there was a spectrograph, um, imager, and like a combination of the two. So one that could do both spectra and uh, imaging. And so alas, we didn't get to go because of COVID, very upsetting. Uh, but the uh, professor who was in charge of the project ended up actually getting half a night at the telescope to observe one of our objects from a colleague. And so he went there about a month before we were supposed to go. Um, and he like went on Zoom with us, showed us how observing was done and all that, showed us the control room. He actually taught class we, we, um, for three, three hours from the control room of the observatory. So that was really cool. Uh, and so these are some images that he took while there um, and sent us. So you can see what the telescope looks like. Um, yeah, so this is what the night sky looks like at Magellan. It is wonderful. I'm pretty sure this was taken with an ordinary camera, um, so not even like a fancy CCTV or anything. You can see the band of the Milky Way stretching across diagonally across the image. Um, on the lower centerish, I believe it's one of the Magellanic clouds. Possibly. That was going to be my question. Um, yeah. I do not know the southern sky because I've never been to the southern hemisphere. Um, Is that Sagittarius, the, the, the couple of stars just kind of in the upper middle of the image? These? Yeah. Okay, so this, honestly, this looks like Cygnus to me, but I'm probably wrong about that because it's just a cross in the sky. Oh, it might be the southern cross. Oh. Yeah, I have no idea what constellations exist in the Southern Hemisphere, and that was one of the reasons I was excited to go, because I really wanted to go see the Magellanic Clouds by eye, amongst other things. Um, but you can see, you can tell that there's the arm, and you can also see this like dark nebula over at the top of the image. So a lot more detail than you can see from somewhere like your keys. Um, so this is what the observatory looks like. Um, 
down from the road. So you take a little, it's up on the top of a mountain, so it's pretty arid there, and there are no trees. Um, up the two domes that you've done, and then there's some houses down, which uh, like Mark showed us in the previous image, there's, um, it's like a dormitory for where observers stay, sleep, and eat. Uh, people kind of, I don't know, some people forget that when you're on the mountain, you need somewhere to eat. And so Magellan actually has its own chef. Uh, and it, he's apparently been there for many, many years, like hotel trained and all that. And apparently Magellan has some of the best food of any observatories that you could go to. Uh, apparently their empanadas on Sundays are very, very good. Um, so I was very there's an echo somewhere? Question? Oh, it's gone. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so apparently the empanadas there are very good, and I'm sad that we never got to try those. Oh well. Um, but yeah, so there's more of the road. There is an animal on the road. Uh huh. Um, I I do not remember if this is an alpaca llama guanaco or one of the other related <laughs> animals that exists down there, so I'm not even going to try to name it. Um, but it's just, you know, standing there on the road. Patrick, um, if you look at the comments, uh, Jeff has a new slogan oh. for, uh, for Magellan. <laughs> Go for the observing, stay for the empanadas. Yes, um, I like that a lot. Only on Sundays, so I swear one day I will go there and I will try the empanadas. We expect pictures. Of course. Uh, you'll probably get like a video vlog or something. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is a view from a dormitory. You have these like black curtains, which are pretty important because you really want to go get some sleep after you've been observing all night. Um, <laughs> Usually what happens uh, when you go up there is you have you have a dinner and you also get a packed lunch. It's called a night meal um, that you usually eat well at night when you're observing and hungry. Uh, apparently, uh, we were shown the observatory also has this cabinet full of snacks and coffee and stuff you can have. So you'll never go hungry there. Um, but yeah, the curtains are super important then for when you want to go back down in the morning and get your sleep before rising again for dinner to get up and do more of your analysis and planning for your next night if you have another one. Um, yeah, the something about the, the cooking and the snacks. I've also, uh, most observatories where I've been, there's usually, there there's always a good chef there that makes really good food and the snacks. One nice thing about going to observe in Hawaii is that there's also a lot of Japanese astronomers who observe there, and they have a way to get wonderful uh, cook-it-yourself miso soup that Ooh. is really tasty. And I've only had that there because uh, Japanese astronomers bring that by the boxes. <laughs> yes. Well, now now I want to go observe in Hawaii, but. I know that Keck recently moved to remote observing. I mean, so you still like go there and you can sit in a control room, but you don't actually go up to the telescope. That's it. Who knows? Um, but yeah, and here is just one of the telescopes up close and personal. So it looks a little different than the observatories that you're probably familiar with, like the ones Mark showed us, uh, Kit Peak, Palomar, also Yerkes. Is very boxy and metallic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Honestly, it hardly looks like an observatory, if you can imagine. Um, and this is just from um, underneath. Underneath it, there's the view. So it's pretty big. <laughs> you can fit yourself underneath to look at the beautiful mountains down there. Um, and so, yeah, that's Magellan. I will go one day, I swear. <laughs> and we'll have a whole episode episode dedicated to it. Yes, exactly. But yeah, so uh, one of the things I like is how we've mentioned about how there are 
multiple ways of doing a lot of these observing runs uh, back from when Yerkes started up and you they just had professors that lived there and taught there and did all of their studies to then putting them up on mountains where you get to make these really cool trips. And now today where a lot of them are just operated by a controller and your uh, requests are sent in. I mean, similar to, um, I'm working on a show for the planetarium, the Horace Dreamer Planetarium in Waukesha about uh, the Hubble as it's the 30th anniversary. Obviously, nobody is taking the trip up to observe with the Hubble. Uh, you kind of have to send in all of your commands for that. So the way that you collect your data in astronomy really has changed just in the last hundred years alone. And I'm assuming will continue to change quite a bit. Uh, yeah. and it's really cool, Mark, that you had the unique experience of actually designing and kind of building a tool for a telescope. It's a fun thing, yeah. But you know, also the thing is, as an astronomer, it's kind of a risk to do that because then you spend a lot of time building instruments and you're not really, you don't really have time to, uh, to observe and to write papers. So, and then the big discoveries get done by people who use your data to do other things. But uh, these days, actually, the people that are mostly ob using telescopes and actually going to telescopes are people who, who build instruments. Because for most other astronomers, you either observe remotely or you just submit your observation. You say, I want this, 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 this observed. And then the um, personnel at the telescope then does the observations and you know and sends you an email saying hey here's your data right yeah yeah and i've experienced that more uh that's the only actually the only thing i've experienced so far um because the our class is... afterward like, applied for time on other telescopes that actually do either you go check a website and on the website the images you can see them coming in throughout the night, so that's fun. Or so there's an observer there who goes and shows you the images, you communicate with them, they send everything to you. And then you also have the yeah. unique opportunity with like SEO, where we're the remote operators doing all of the planning and observing ourselves. Yes. And there's nobody at the telescope. Right. Nope. Which yeah. is that part I... I wish there was someone because there have been times we ran into technical issues. The nice thing about there being someone on the mountain is that if there is a technical issue, usually a telescope operator also has a great wealth of knowledge about the instrument. They can troubleshoot it. They know how it works inside out and they know how to swap out instruments and debug things when everything goes wrong. Uh, so that's a real asset to having a dedicated operator at a telescope who knows what they're doing and have probably been doing it for a very long time. Yeah, the, the other, I think another, the reason why it makes sense for astronomers not to travel to telescopes now that we can do remote observing is, A, it's, you're less efficient if you spend a lot of time traveling and also it's expensive. And you know, just like the telescopes, at the end it's the taxpayers who pay for most of what we do as astronomers. And then we have a responsibility to make sure we use these funds efficiently and just fly jetting back and forth to Pitt Peak or Palomar or anywhere else is not really efficient. So now that we actually have the possibility to do remote observing, it's this is why most people are doing it. Right. And well, we've already gone well past our usual uh, cutoff time, but there was just too much to talk about. And Mark, I can't thank you enough for spending an hour and a half with us and sharing your incredible experience with the Hale Telescope with us. My pleasure. Thanks a lot for all the questions. And for everybody else in the chat, uh, we are planning to do at least two of these per month moving forward. And uh, so just keep in mind, Katya is also starting grad school while also helping me maintain the quality of these streams. So, um, you know, say a little prayer for Katya as she begins classes next week. Woohoo! Yay! Ready to suffer. <laughs> <laughs> and also ready to have fun and learn a lot and make new friends. Don't worry. Um, we will also at some point 
uh, we will be sending you and other people uh, a little Google form with a little survey that we would like people to fill out because we want feedback on these shows. We want to know what's working, what you like, what you don't like, if you have any suggestions, tips for us, etc. So please, please, please fill that out. Uh, send it to your friends. That would be great. We love feedback. Yeah, we just want to know how we can make this into even a more interactive or just a more engaging type of show. And we really want to be able to see this thing kind of grow from here. And I know, Mark, sometime we'll have to have you back to talk a little bit about Hawk. So we'll have to, uh, I'll just tease that now and we'll get you back sometime in the future. We're definitely doing a That's show good, about yeah. a telescope on an airplane. To it. <laughs> All right, with that... Yeah. Uh, everybody else, have a wonderful night and uh, enjoy your weekend. Good night, everyone. Bye.